Isaiah 43 is an interesting chapter. It's also a possibly con confusing chapter. So we're going to go on a journey together through this text so that we can understand not only what the Lord is saying to us through it, but also what it requires of us. Now this, this week, uh, what's especially on my heart, soul, and mind is how we do so in this particular nation. A nation with the particular history that we have, a nation founded upon political and economic exploitation and violence, and in some ways a nation that continues to spend more time and resources insisting that wounds, that insisting that, that those wounds have already been healed rather than actually healing those wounds. Frankly, this text gives us resources to know, to understand, and to ask what does it mean to be the people of God in Babylon? What does it mean to be God's covenant people? in a foreign land. The first section of Isaiah 43 repeats the message that we talked about a few weeks ago, do not fear. But the reason that the people of God are not to fear is different. If you remember in chapter 41, verse 10, we're told, the Lord says, do not fear, for I am with you. The comfort in that passage is the comfort of the presence of God. I assume that this is the comfort of, a, of skydiving with a professional. You're in a terrifying situation, but, but, you're, but you're with someone who knows what they're doing. I mean, I'm never going to be in that situation, but some of you might be. The comfort here is a little bit different. The Lord gives a different reason not to fear in this text. Chapter 43, verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. In other words, do not fear because of what I have done for you. Have you ever thought about why, why we love the Lord? You know the songs that encourage us to praise God because of who he is, sometimes in contrast to praising him for what he's done? The scriptures actually tell us that we actually know who God is by what he does. And actually, we're told explicitly that we love and honor God because of what he does. This is what, this is what we're, we're, we're told in 1 John 4:19. We love because he first loved us. Now, at first, this is a little bit weird. Because I want you to think about your relationships, your, your friendships, your family. It seems kind of uncomfortable to say that you love someone because of what they do for you. Like, it, feel, it feels kind of selfish, mostly because it suggests that if they stop doing that thing, then you'll stop loving them. If I only love you because you compliment me, if you stop complimenting me, I'll stop loving you. It's a flimsy foundation for a relationship, right? And yet with the Lord, it's different. The people of Israel are told not to fear because God has already redeemed them. That is, don't fear, not just because God is, is the kind of God who redeems, but because he has specifically redeemed you. I want you to hear these first four verses of this chapter in all of their very specific comfort starting with, I have summoned you by name. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Sebop in your, in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. The Lord makes clear here, as he does throughout the Pentateuch, that he has singled out his people, the people of Israel, as his precious possession. Yes, God loves all of his creation. But that love looks a little bit different for his people. Everybody gets some of the gifts of God's providence, his, his sustaining power, his, his, the breath that people breathe, their, their continued life, and sometimes material blessing. All of that we call common grace. But the people of God, who have been called by, God, by name, God's people, they receive a slightly different kind of grace, a, a saving and redeeming grace. These are the people who know what it is to be forgiven. These are the people who know what it is to be set free. These are the ones who are told not to fear. But the other thing that the people of God know is that God is willing to do whatever it takes to set his people free. 
In fact, we're told in this passage that the Lord says that he's, going, that he's willing to sacrifice entire nations for their ransom, to buy them back from slavery, to, to redeem them from their oppression. Why? Because he loves them. It's verse 4. They are precious and honored in his sight. The Lord saves because the Lord loves. And the Lord saves like no one else does because the Lord loves like no one else does. And so this, this text presses, yes, the love and the salvation of God, but it also presses the redemptive creativity of God. This is the primary thrust of the passage that we just read, verses 16 to 21. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. I want to pause there for a moment. Because the Lord is obviously recalling a very specific incident. An incident that the people of God are supposed to constantly remember. An event that cements the character of God in the minds of his people. The, the, the event that tells the people of God, who is this God? It's the Exodus. Remember? It's like he's telling the people, remember, remember when the Lord brought you to the edge of the sea? And you didn't know where you were going to go, and he parted that sea, and you walked on dry land, pursued by the army of the enslaver, and what did the Lord do? He crashed the seas upon them to save you. Given that he's that kind of God, God says in verses 18 to 21, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. The God that we serve is eager to save in new ways. When, when, he, when he says forget the former things and do not dwell in the past, he's, he's obviously not saying forget the exodus. What he's saying is don't dwell on your oppression, even your current oppression under Babylon, because, you, because we have to remember the Lord is a God of salvation, a God of liberation, a God who is constantly looking to work those things. We serve a God who is constantly doing the work of making ways in wildernesses and streams in wastelands. We serve a God that's not only interested in doing that in a cosmic new heavens and new earth kind of way, though he is going to do that and is doing that, but he also wants to do it in an everyday way, in your relationships, in your marriages, in your friendships, in your communities. But here's the issue, because there's always an issue. The Lord, being the kind of God that he is, also has a beef with his people. Verses 22 to 24, yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with, with demands for incense. You, you, have, you have not bought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the, the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins, and wearied me with your offenses. That is, given the kind of God that I am, I expect my people to react and live in a particular way, but you haven't done that. We haven't done that. Let me bring that home a little bit. For the people of God in this passage, the primary act of God's salvation is the exodus. That's what the scriptures constantly draw the minds of the people of God back to, when they forget who they are and how they're supposed to live. The Christian, for the Christian, the focus is on God's other primary act of liberation in human history, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, at, at the cross, God is in Christ reconciling all things to himself. And in both the exodus and the cross and the resurrection, we have not only cosmos-defining events, but people-forming events. When God freed the people from, from slavery in Egypt, he made them a people. He bound them together with the common experience of being set free. And he gave them a law. He told them, they will, you will be my people and I will be your God. He gave them a particular mandate. He told them, look, live as a distinct people. So you bear witness to the world that a society that's ruled by God has more joy, more peace, more power, and more justice than any other society. That's the way that the people of Israel were supposed to live. 
and yet they were unable and unwilling to do this very thing. And so, the Lord devised a plan for a different kind of people-forming event, to expand the people that he had already called. The Son of God took on flesh and did not see equality with God as as an opportunity to be hoarded, but instead sought to share it. And so Jesus comes not only to preach and to heal, but to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come. That God will provide the resources for his people to live in the way that he commanded them to live. To proclaim that God is going to remove the obstacles to joy, the obstacles to peace, the obstacles to redeeming power. And so everyone who followed Jesus asked the same question. How? How is this possible? Rome is too big. My sickness is too debilitating. My relationships are too broken. And how does, and, and how does Jesus respond? He dies. A brutal and humiliating death. Can you imagine the disappointment? Can you imagine people used to God acting on their behalf in spectacular ways, expecting Jesus to do something crazy, and then he dies? Publicly? By crucifixion? Talk about embarrassing. But the people didn't realize, even though Jesus told them, that crucifixion is part one. That in order to be liberated, the oppressor needed to die. Death needed to be defeated. And the way that Jesus defeated death and sin and the devil was by exhausting and embarrassing them on the cross. That symbol of imperial power, dominance, and shame became the very thing that caused that empire of death to fall. Jesus triumphs on and through the cross. The Gospel of John even presses that that if we're going to ask the question of where is Christ glorified, the answer is the cross. But the cross is not by itself the people-forming event. If anything, when we read the Gospels, the cross seems to break people apart. It seems to be a giant loss. The the, the disciples go back to their former lives and they think that we've wasted our time and energy on this dude who just gave us false hope. And so Jesus does a new thing. The likes of which nobody had seen before. He got up from the dead. And the moment at which this becomes, this very fact becomes mundane for the people of God is the moment that we fail to be the people that God has called us to be. We serve a God, we serve a Savior who died and came back. And this, and this, is, in, this, is, this is the substance of our hope. Because if the Son of God can die and come back, he can do anything. And yet we live lives of fear, of apprehension and worry, because we don't think that God's going to do what he, what he said, what, not only what he can do, but what he promised that he will do. You may be facing a situation that you think is intractable, an obstacle that you think is too high, a relationship that that perhaps has been a thorn in your side for years, or a particular struggle where there are days when you think things will never never get better. And and, And it is precisely in these moments when you and I need to be reminded of the kind of God that we serve. We serve a God of liberation, a God who not only sets people free, but who delights in setting people free. A God of all power, a God of great love, but most importantly, we serve a God who delights in making dead things come back to life. We serve a God who who creatively creates, who looks at a barren wasteland and thinks, I'm going to make this team with abundant life. Some of you may look at particular elements of your life and think, this is nothing but a barren, chaotic wasteland, and I encourage you to remember the God that we serve, a God of resurrection. As we speak, congregations around this nation are holding Celebrate America and God and Country services. Some of you may be familiar with churches that are eager to proclaim that this country is a Christian nation, and if it isn't now, there are people insistent on making it one. Desiree and I had a great week watching the the four-part documentary on on the Duggar family, the 19 kids and counting folks, shiny, happy people. So one of the most disturbing parts of the documentary is where the cult that they're a part of has this specific program called the Joshua Generation. And its purpose is training Christian homeschool kids to join the highest levels of the American government. The legislature, the Supreme Court, is wild stuff. But it is not uncommon. Here's our heresy of the day. It's called dominionism. 
So common in some, uh, in, in, in some churches uh, is this understanding that what Christians are supposed to do is embed themselves in the state to bring the kingdom of God to earth. Now let me be clear about something. That way of thinking is garbage. Yes, it's a strong word. Yes, you're going to think of all these exceptions. I want you to bracket those exceptions for a moment and consider this. You don't bring the kingdom of God to earth. Jesus already did it and is going to do it. The the, the scriptures never command you to bring the kingdom. Jesus tells us that you, the church, are the kingdom and he's going to bring the rest. The kingdom of God does not come through reform. It doesn't come through tinkering with world systems through the influence of family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. If you don't know what those are, those are called the seven mountains in the seven mountain mandate. The kingdom of God comes through cataclysm. It comes from the creation of new structures from below, structures of justice that we build among the body. See, July 4th is not our most important Independence Day. I mean, it's already not that for me because of the nation's insistence on maintaining chattel slavery while still claiming to be the land of the free. It's also, it's not a church holiday. So be patriotic, sure. Be thankful for the freedoms that we have in this country, even the freedoms that we fought for. But don't think that those freedoms are necessary for us to do what the Lord has called us to do. The people of God were called to be the people of God in Babylon. We have brothers and sisters around the globe who suffer under repressive and persecuting governments. Their distinctiveness is obviously a threat to those governments, and they face persecution because of it. But what about us? Is our distinct material love and support for one another a threat to the exploitative systems we find ourselves in? Is our insistence on brotherhood and sisterhood a threat to the systems of domination around us? Or are we good to blend in? None of the folks... None of of the things that folks celebrate in the history of this country formed the people of God. And nothing they do or don't do can break apart the people of God. Because Because our day of liberation was the day of resurrection. When Jesus got up, ascended, and sent his spirit, he gathered a people who, wherever they were, would, would bear witness to the world that there is no real ruling authority but the triune God. It's not often that confessional documents preach, but sometimes they do. And I'm Presbyterian on most things, but when it comes to political theology, I'm a Mennonite. And so this is what the Mennonite Confession of Faith says about the reign of God. We believe that the church is called to live now according to the model of the future reign of God. Thus, we are given a foretaste of the kingdom that God will one day establish in full. The church is to be a spiritual, social, and economic reality, demonstrating now the justice, righteousness, love, and peace of the age to come. The church does this in obedience to its Lord and in anticipation that the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord. We are not here to tell the state how to run. We are here to show the world how to run by living in obedience to Christ. This is the new thing that God has done in the cross. This is is God's purpose from salvation. This, 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 This is God's purpose in salvation. If we think about the purpose of the covenant that God made with his people, when he, not just the, there's the covenant he makes with Abraham, and then there's the covenant that he makes with his people after freeing them from Egypt. But throughout the Old Testament, we're told that he promises to his people, I will be your God and you will be my people. The cross and the resurrection extend that covenant and and remind us that it applies to all those who place their faith in Christ. You will be God's people and he will be your God. That means that he gives you the will and the resources to live lives of justice, of righteousness, of love, and, and of peace. That you can't live apart from him. That, dear brother and dear sister, is the good news, that when you repent and believe, the Lord doesn't merely make you a new person. He does that. you, You are born again, but you're born again into a new family. You're born again into a new kind of society. And let me add one more thing to tie it even tighter. Isaiah 43, 25 is a mind blowing verse. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And remembers your sins no more. For my own sake. The Lord forgives you for his sake. 
Yes, his forgiveness helps you. And yes, he does it because he loves you. But he also does it for him. What is he talking about? The Lord is drawing attention to the fact that God always keeps his promises. And so when he said that his people are going to be his people, and he said that he's going to be their God, he meant it. Covenants are only as strong and reliable as the people making them. Many a marriage has been actively broken by infidelity, by abandonment, or by abuse. Many a promise has been broken in our friendships and in our, and, and in our other relationships. But God is saying, when I make a promise, I'm putting myself on the line for it. He materially showed us that when he sent his son to die. But here God says it. I'm saving you so that you make me look good. When the Lord makes that promise, he does so knowing that we, being the fickle, sinful people that we are, are going to mess up. And so we're told in Hebrews 6.13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no, no one greater to, to swear by, he swore by himself. And verse 17 because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. Sounds self-serving, but it's not, because the Lord of our salvation is awesome, and we should have no problem showing people that that's the case. The Lord has one overarching intention for his people, dear brother and dear sister, that they, that we, would buy our love for one another, Show the world the future to come and invite them to that future. To be a Christian, to be united to Christ, to be a repentant believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit is to be committed to the building of this new community and to expect the Lord to do what he's promised. So what can you do this week? Ask and expect the Lord to do new things. Ask him to do what he does best, to bring the dead back to life. And while you engage in that asking, live lives that reveal to your coworkers, to your family, to your friends and others, how good the God, how good the God you serve is. Your willingness, you and, you and I, our, our willingness to look to one another's interests, or in other words, our willingness to love our neighbor, is going to be surprising to folks. But that's what the Lord calls us to do. Live lives in the confidence that the God that you serve is making all things new. And he has chosen to, he's, he's chosen to partner with you in doing that work. This isn't true because God's going to place you in a place of political power to change laws or whatever, but because he chooses to change the world through his people, the church. And you, as a member of that body, have the privilege and responsibility to build that body. A body of deep, of deep economic solidarity, a body of, of deep sacrificial love, and a body that draws its strength and its power from its head, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 43 is a specific word of comfort from God to his people. A word from a God who loves fiercely and without compromise. To Israel... He's saying that Babylon doesn't have the last word because God had the first word and every word to follow. We serve a God who's not only willing to give up everything, but who actually did so that you might live. It's a chapter that sometimes feels, I think, like a kind of whiplash back and forth, but it's because that's, how, that's sometimes how real relationships go. And God has called you to be a part of this very real people. And so when you look to your right and you look to your left, don't just see men and women whom you happen to sit with today. See a brother or sister whom God fiercely loves. And go and live accordingly. Let's pray.